All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, happy to be talking to a UFC veteran, also a, and a pioneer of MMA in Australia overall, has competed at both light heavyweight as well as heavyweight. I'm talking to Anthony Parash. How's your day going so far there, Anthony? Sorry, how's my... I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, I was just wondering how your day was going so far. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, good. It's uh, it's midnight now, uh, Wednesday nights. Um, had a you know full full day of um, teaching in the morning, teaching at night. So it's it's a good day. Yeah, and I'd seen like obviously a while back at this point, but as you know, it's affected other people too. The whole COVID nineteen thing has Team Parash Mixed Martial Arts managed to adapt and kind of you know get things going in a different way with the backdrop of the pandemic. Like you just talk about coming off of training there, like what adjustments were kind of made with all that there um well, th- thankfully you know um, australia seems to be doing a lot better than some other countries we were we, we did uh, shut down completely last year for three months between march and june <clears throat> and then um, at the end of june uh we were able to reopen and with, with restrictions but pretty much since then it's just it's been going 100 percent 100 miles an hour like um um you know we're breaking records in terms of people signing up and training and wanting to stay i think you know the three months off really really uh, um fired up a few people so yeah we're, we're pretty fortunate over here at the moment well it's good to hear that it could function to put certain things in perspective for some people and now that you say that actually i was speaking to janae harding ahead of her last bellator fight and i think she said there was like two cases in the state altogether. so great to hear you guys are doing all right yeah look um, you, you know at the moment we're having a bit of a um for, for, for a month there or two we were we didn't have a single case in the whole of australia let, let alone the state but now in the last couple of weeks, you know, there's a few hot spots um, appearing here and there, and everyone's getting worried, and politicians are getting worried, and shutting down borders again. But um, I, you know, I think we'll, we'll get through it like we did before. Yeah, for sure. I think there will be you know the light at the end of the tunnel there for sure. But I'm kind of wondering when. Sure. Yeah, for sure. But I'm kind of wondering when the path initially started, kind of guiding towards MMA here. Like I was seeing you had some fights there towards the end of 2003 there from what looks to be a one night tournament there. So what was that first foray out there into competition like? Well, my, yeah, that was my MMA debut. Um, and, uh, I think it was like the, the last eight man tournament uh, in, in one night that was happening in Australia. So uh, I thought, no, I'll give it a go. And it, was, it was in a boxing ring, it wasn't in the cage. Um, and you know, it was my debut, and I had three matches in one night. I won all three. Had there been like a prior instance of like seeing mixed martial arts beyond that, like say like a UFC or Pride or something like that, or was it more a factor of you were a martial artist? There was this local competition going on, and you're like, hey, I'll take part in this. Like, was there an awareness of UFC and Pride? Oh, uh, uh, not pretty. Uh, look, uh, I about not you know nineteen. 95 was like my first intro to bjj and much like many other people you know we, we only only about a year before that you know was the first ufc so um you know back then it was just vhs tapes as a few vh tapes you know lying people had you know the ufc and different cage fighting shows and you know i was a martial arts that's what got me into bjj and, you know, I was always a BJJ competitor first. And I guess for, for me, you know, being a competitor, I wanted to, you know, test my skills in the MMA arena. So, so it was kind of like a natural progression. Yeah, and the record here showing you won the first three fights straight there as part of that, you know, one-night tournament there. What was the methodology like taking part in something like one of those one-night tournaments? Because like you said, it kind of had gotten phased out more so after the fact like what's it like taking part in something like that i wager the methodology is a lot different fighting three times in one night as compared to one well look um you, you can only take one one match at a time i, I you know i remember quite quite uh, vividly just had to t- take one match at a time and um 
you know, with my, my style of fighting, I like to, to, you know, close the gap quickly and put them against the ropes or cage and, you know, grind them down to the ground. So, um, you just have to take one match at a time and fortunate, fortunate enough for me, you know, uh, each match I was up to win the first round. So, uh, it was almost at the end of, at the end of the night after my three matches, it was like having the one, 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 uh, three round fight. Yeah, and then just some fights after that, obviously, over the Australian circuit, Shooto Australia and some other circuits there. But then I'm seeing you get the call up for the UFC debut there, and you're fighting a pretty established name there and Jeff Munson in the heavyweight ranks. Like, what are your recollections of, like, when the offer was initially put out to you and just the general timeline leading to the UFC debut? Oh, look, I, uh, you know, when, when the UFC calls, you, you know, you're not going to say no. I realized, you know, in hindsight, I probably wasn't ready for it yet because, you know, I only had five or six um, MMA matches up until then. And um, and looking back, I was in the wrong division too. Like, I'm, I'm a natural light heavyweight. So I mean, I was just a bit lazy back then. And But, uh, you know, a heavyweight match... Um, um, Appeared like uh, Joe Silver says, I've got a light heavy, uh, heavyweight match against Jeff Watson. Do you want it? I went, yeah, of course. Book me in. Yeah, when was that point you realized that light heavyweight would probably be your most ideal division? Because even that tournament we were talking about was a heavyweight foray as well. Like, when did you realize that I guess light heavyweight would be the optimal weight class for you? Yeah, even 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 that tournament was like a modified heavyweight. That that um, that eight man tournament I debuted in was under one hundred kilos or under two twenty pounds, as opposed to you know the heavyweight now, which is two sixty five or you know one twenty kilos. But pretty pretty much after um, I had two two UFC matches as a heavyweight in two thousand six. And I lost both of those, and um, you know, after that, I pretty much said, told myself, no, I'm, I'm, I'm too small for these heavyweights. I'm going down. You got to be on some big cards pretty early on, though. I mean, in that initial UFC foray there, like I mean, UFC 61, the bitter rivals card there that was a stacked card, and then also UFC 66, the Liddell versus Ortiz rematch there that obviously garnered a lot of pay-per-view buys so i mean was it still was there still some benefit being part of those events just in terms of like i guess the spectacle and yeah, of course yeah i have i have no regrets whatsoever like um, you know i learned a lot i was very very fortunate for the for the opportunity back then and you know i'm proud to be a part of those um cards yeah actually imagine being part of something like liddell versus ortiz was quite exciting just because of the unprecedented nature of it almost like it seemed like there was such a spotlight on it that had not been on the sport prior to that point at least on that level of domestic attention i guess so that must have been a cool thing to be a part of get caught up in the hoopla and everything yes yes it was a, a very cool because you know I, I, um when zufa took over uh ufc i think it was like ufc 30 or 32 you know i followed you know watched all the ufc's and the in the, in the the numbered thirties and the forties and the fifties, so I was you know I was following the the, the um, career of you know Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell, and so yeah, I was looking forward to to their matchup. Yeah, and then after that, you endeavor to go on like a different kind of circuit there, like the cage fighting championship circuit, and then Rise MMA Australia. Also, from what I was seeing, like what did you learn during that? Pe- Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 yeah. Well, after you know, after my two two UFC losses, you know, I, I got released from UFC since like you know, back to the drawing board. So um, I knew I wanted to, to get back into the UFC again, uh, but this time as a light heavyweight. So you know, I went back to the local circuit and fought on a local circuit. You know, had match after match, win after win, and you know, until I got my shot uh, back in the UFC. <laughs> Yeah, and how did you feel you'd grown it, like as compared to like the previous UFC run versus where you were at during the second run? Because I imagine there was a lot of growth between those two periods there. Oh, absolutely! Like, um, um, just just in in the way we trained too. You know, I had to 
a full a f- with the second UFC um, my second UFC run. You know, had had a, a striking coach, a wrestling coach, a BJJ coach, and then an, an overall MMA coach. Plus, you know, worked on the strength and conditioning and nutrition, and you know, had the whole package. So, so I was more than more than ready for for my second run. Yeah, and it seemed like the experience was the biggest factor, as you alluded to, because during that initial UFC run, you'd only had a few fights to your credit, but the second UFC run, it's like now you're a grounded, established martial artist, so I imagine the experience paid dividends. Oh, absolutely. Plus, uh, the experience in, in doing the, um, you know, the full training camps, and then the weight cut, um, and then, you know, rehydrating, and then, you know, preparing for the fights, and yeah, the, this in, invaluable experience. And I understand there was a bit of a backstory to the UFC return. Like, I think Joe Silva was kind of sizing you up in the hotel lobby, and he's like, hey, do you want to fight Mirko Krokop? Like, what are your recollections of all of that there? It, um, it was, um, I remember, like, it was yesterday as well, like, uh, uh, Krokop. It was actually using my my uh, my gym the week of the fight, so he was coming every day into my gym and you know using my facilities and, and training with his coaches. And then all, all of a sudden, two days, so I, I became uh, friends with him. And then two days before the fight, Joe Silva comes up and looking up and down, and he says, "What do you weigh?" I go, "Oh, about two twenty." He goes, "Do you want to fight?" I went, "Sure." And I thought um, I was going to replace um, uh, Elvis Sinisic because he, he just pulled out of his fight against Chris Hazeman, which is a light heavyweight match. So I thought I was going to jump in and, and into that match. And then Joe Silva just all of a sudden pulls out, oh, um, do you want to fight Krokop? <laughs> and I looked at him and I go, no. And I actually said no. And then he goes, okay. And then about an hour later, I'm just thinking to myself, I'm going, what did I just do? I just, I just turned down fighting one of the biggest names in MMA in front of my home crowd at, on, on the first UFC card in Australia. So I called him back, uh, Joe Silvig, and I said, no, I'll, I want to do it. He goes, what made you change your mind? And, you know, I just told him all those things. He goes, great, let's book it. Yeah, and then just like the actual fight itself, I mean, just what an experience that was. Like, I remember that pretty vividly. Like, and it seemed like you got on people's radars in a way, even despite the outcome not, you know, being in your favor per se. But I think you showed a lot of valor in that particular fight, especially stepping up short notice. Do you think that fight was like a big, like, I guess, game changer for you in a lot of ways, despite maybe not getting the desired result there? Yeah, um, uh, um, I even, I um, even before, uh, after after that fight, or even, or during that fight first, you know, even, you know, I was, you know, keeping my distance. You know, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, playing my striking game, and I was able to get close and put him against the cage. I actually grabbed like a single leg, going for a single leg takedown. But I think I remember in my head, I was already, already celebrating too early. You know, thinking that I'm going to get into the ground soon, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. I should, you know. I should have <laughs> kept going with that takedown until I actually had him on the ground. But uh, yeah, I learned, learned a lot from that fight. And then after that fight, you know, Joe Silva gave me a, gave me a four fight um, contract with the UFC, and with my next match being as a as a light heavyweight. Yeah, and then in that next match, I mean, just what a performance that was, too. I mean, getting the first UFC victory over Tom Blackledge there. First round rear naked choke. You're on a big card out there in Sydney, Australia. Just all factors considered, what was that moment like for you, man? Oh, look, uh, that was probably my number one highlight. You know, very first UFC win. Um, and and like, like you said, I did it in front of my home crowd with a rear naked choke. I couldn't have asked, you know, I couldn't have written uh, a better finish um, uh, to, for my day, for my first win. Yeah, and then you went on a bit of a streak after that there. Like you had that fight with Cyril Diabate that I remember I was quite intrigued by leading into it. Just I thought it was like a fun 
stylistic matchup and yeah just the fight ended up playing out in an entertaining way what do you remember about fighting diabate just fighting this real rangy like lanky kind of striker there yeah well um, at, at, at the time i fought him he was actually ranked he was actually ranked number one in the ufc as the most accurate striker so so you know my boxing coach at the start of the train camp he goes anthony are you ready to run a marathon so we really worked a lot on footwork during that match and uh, during that training camp and um I just want to you know stay out of his range stay out of his range and, and just keep moving like, like not stand still because he's he's like a sniper where he doesn't throw many strikes he's very, the, the ones he strikes he connects and he connects the most if you're standing still so we made, we made sure that i kept moving 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 and um and then I was able to time, time a couple of takedowns off his off his uh, body kicks and, and take him down and you know use my ground pound and, and uh, finish with a rear naked choke as well. Yeah, great second round finish there in that one. And then you have the Nick Penner fight shortly thereafter, and you're just putting together that streak now at this juncture. But I'm kind of wondering if there's a bit of a unique feeling with the Penner fight in as far as like you're getting the finish via strikes now. Like, obviously, I imagine you're excited getting these submission finishes because of your, you know, great jujitsu resume, and that's what initially got you into MMA competition. But is there, like, a certain confidence you get from, like, a TKO victory? Does, like, does that galvanize your striking efforts at all? Is there a unique sort of dynamic with getting a finish like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Y- yes, but but uh, I guess with that, you know with that TKO victory, it wasn't it wasn't from stand up strikes. Like I still, you know, I used my strikes to take him down, and I got to the mount position, yeah. and um, I was striking him from mount, and then that's when the referee stopped it from there. Yeah, I guess some of your later uh, victories, which I'll shortly be getting to, I guess that would be more of an instance of the striking confidence being emboldened there. But yeah, another victory on home soil there in the Penner fight there. So I imagine that must have felt great. It seems like you got a few chances to compete on home soil with UFC. I imagine that was quite important to you. Uh, well, at, 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 at the time um, of, of those um, those couple of UFCs, there weren't that many Australians on the, in the UFC. Like pretty much it was, I think it was three or four of us. Um, whereas now there's almost like 30, 30, 30 Australian New Zealand fighters in the UFC at the moment. Whereas back then um, there's only like three or four, maybe five. So they wanted, they wanted to every time the, they had a show in Australia, they wanted to make sure Australians were on it. So I guess that was one of the reasons I, I was lucky enough to um, fight and also win um, in front of my home crowd. Yeah, and just a bit of a sidebar from your competitive career, just because you mentioned it there. Like, how cool is it to see this new influx of Australian talent? Not even just on a level of fighters, but I mean, like, media with, like, you know, submission radio. They're putting out great stuff. Robert Whitaker becoming the first Australian to hold a UFC belt. I mean, you've got Megan Anderson coming up in that featherweight title fight. Like, how cool is it to kind of see this new influx of Australian talent and then also realize you laid the groundwork for that? Oh, it's amazing. And we've got, you know, we've got Alex uh, Volkanovski as well. Absolutely. And, uh, and, um, and, you know, just across the road in New Zealand, you know, Israel, Adesanya. So, um, it's, it's, you know, Australian New Zealand fighters, uh, we're, we're, you know, fighters to be reckoned with. Uh, there's there's a, a, a huge MMA circuit, a local circuit, which, you know, there's a lot of fighters, a lot of academies, and, you know, they all have a goal of not only making it to the UFC, but, uh, you know, becoming UFC world champion as well. So it's a, it's really, really a good time, a good place to be um, uh, if you like MMA and want to be an MMA champion, is, you know, here in Australia. Yeah, it's a vibrant scene, and it's cool to, it's cool to see that for sure, man. But then, just going back to the competitive career here, I mean, you have a pair of bouts that I imagine are pretty interesting in a sense, like just diametrically opposed outcomes in a lot of ways. I mean, you end up having two fights that are 21 seconds combined. Like, obviously, there was that Ryan Jimmo fight there where you end up on the losing end of a KO punch at the seven second mark. But then in the very next outing, a KO victory over Vinny Magalash at UFC 163 and 
got the knockout of the night distinction in 14 seconds there. What was that pocket of your career like? Because like I said, diametrically opposed outcomes. I imagine a myriad of emotions through that stretch there. What was, what was that like there? Just two fights, 21 seconds altogether. Well, uh, you know, that's probably like a record, a record in itself somewhere along the line. Like two patches back to back is yeah. you know, 21 seconds. But, and, you know, one win, one loss. But yeah, it was like, like, like you know, we were chatting, you know, I had three wins in a row and I was probably a little bit um, uh, too over overconfident going into the into that match um, uh, with with Ryan, and then just you know you, you just got to be first, you got to be first, got to be fast, and you know I wasn't, and, you know he was, and then then that you know it's tough. It was you know and fighters are after that match, you know fight, you know fighters are only as good as their, their last match, so you know had, had to wait to. Uh, almost a year, maybe a little bit more to, to, to get my redemption. And it just so happened to be, you know, I was fighting Vinny against who's, who's, um, you know, BJJ world champion. And he's, uh, like in his mid twenties. And, and I, I was, uh, 40 at the time. And he says, there was no way I was going to lose to 40 year old. I was going to, you know, I'll retire if I lose. And it was just giving me more motivation. And, you know, I didn't want to, one, I wanted to, you know, redeem myself from my last loss, and two, I wasn't going to let this, uh, you know, young upstart, uh, you know, get the better of me. So uh, I was, mo- I was pumped, I was motivated, never trained as hard as I did for for the Vinny fight, and you know, I got, got the result. Yeah, and that was a curious one because I think a lot of people figured that fight would take place in the grappling just because of your guys' jujitsu acumens there. But 14 second KO, I mean, it just kind of shows the beauty of MMA in as far as like you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, well, you know, my, my, my strongest uh, weapon in, in striking is just my straight right, right cross. And that's what I nailed uh, Vinny with. So, and um, that's what dropped him and he was you know he was dazed so i just finished it off with the ground and pound uh, in the guard yeah and that was a stellar victory i remember that was a very electric one i remember watching that one live for sure but i kind of touched on the jujitsu accolades and stuff like that and i really like jujitsu in as far as like how oriented it is to just the lineage of everything like it seems like that's an important thing and like carlos machado kind of showing you the ropes and stuff like that and whatnot like how cool is it to kind of like carry on the legacy and then be part of that lineage like carry it on to the you know next step and everything like that and just to be part of a martial arts tradition like that uh, i love it you know um uh, uh, that's one of the reasons i love martial arts is is the is the tradition and the lineage and the loyalty and you know i I lead by example, and you know I've been with Carlos now for um, almost 20, 25 years, and you know I've got him, you know got his photo on, on my wall, you know along with the other founders you know, from the, from the founder of uh, BJJ, and um, and I pass that on to my students. So you know I really want to to pass on everything to my students, and you know I want them to be ten times better than me. You know I hope they. I hope they become, you know, multiple world champion in BJJ and, and uh, you know, win a lot more UFC fights than I did and become UFC champion as well. Yeah, and I always loved the nickname that came from the jiu-jitsu game you have too, just the hippo and everything like that. Do you remember who, like, the originator of the hippo nickname was? Because I always thought that was one of the better fighter nicknames. No, it just it happened when... Um, um, you know, early on when I was training, like I always had, always my, my goal back then, even today, and still is today, is you know get on top, stay on top, and finish from on top. So back then, even back then, I had a very top game and heavy game and pressure game, and every time I get on someone, you know they can't get they can't get me off. So they and people just started saying, "Get off me, you big hippo." <laughs> And uh, I kind of stuck from there. Yeah, I definitely always enjoyed that nickname for sure. And yeah, I mean, great top game for sure. I can only imagine how 
stifling the outfield to be on the bottom there. But I mean, just talking about some of the fights you have here, like the Guto in Assange fight was a fight that ended up being the last victory of the UFC run you had there and another first round victory, rear naked choke, you're getting it done and Sydney, Australia again. I'm sure you don't have the realization at the time of it being like such a significant moment, but just kind of looking back on that fight and all those factors I just outlined there, like what did that particular bout mean to you, just being part of that Rockhold versus Bisbing card there? Um, yeah, I felt that was like one of my best performance to date. I, I was really happy with how I did that. And that was actually the first, um, the first, match I, I had after training at uh, Jackson Winklejohn. So I was really happy that I got the results uh, for them as well. Um, but yeah, I was really happy with everything. Everything just came together, my strike and the wrestling, the grappling, and uh, and he was, you know, he was a good opponent as well. So, so I was really happy with that match. Yeah, that was a quality. And on, and on, and on top of that, you know, getting, getting, um, getting it done in front of a home crowd was sort of like just a, extra bonus yeah i imagine that's something you've never fully you never fully like get adjusted to or get jaded to and we're like oh another victory in sydney like i mean imagine that's like a mounting sense of enthusiasm just like adding to an ever-growing story just like a new chapter to the book kind of thing uh yeah it's great it's great because obviously everyone knows you in sydney and you and uh you know you get the biggest cheer you know especially when you win so it's uh, it's uh, it was a great feeling and to that point, like, just with the fighters nowadays competing to no fans, like, what do you think that would be like, just hypothetically? Like, do you, would that be a strange dynamic for you if you were, say, actively competing now and there's this no fans in attendance kind of dynamic? Um, not, not really, because, you know, it, it, you, know uh, you know, my coaches always say to me, and I, I pass the same message on to my students, it doesn't matter who's out there, it doesn't matter if there's you know, twenty five people watching or twenty five thousand. It doesn't. It doesn't. It shouldn't actually matter. Um, so you just go in there and, and do your job. And you know, a lot of the fights I had um, in Australia on the local scene, there wasn't that many people there. Maybe like two, three hundred for a couple of fights, and you know, half of them were fighters and the corner people of the other of the other um, fights that were on the card. So, so you know. I fought on small cars before. If I was fighting today uh, in the UFC, I, I don't think it would be a problem with um, fighting um, fighting in an empty, empty arena. Yeah, you fought to such varying scales of event size over the career. I mean, even the last fight here, like the UFC 193 fight, just that record-breaking Rousey versus Holm fight there and another domestic one for you there. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that was my, my last match. I knew it was going to be in my last match. Probably even the match before, I probably even uh, should have retired. But because, um, you know, I had it in my head that it was, uh, it was just getting a bit harder and harder to, to, to do the training camps. Because at that time I was, I was 43, I think, for, you know, the, the UFC 193. But I wanted to be a part of it because, you know, they were talking about going to Melbourne for so long and um, you know it's going to be a record crowd so I want to be a part of it um, and you know unfortunately I didn't didn't get the result in that one yeah I mean it's still a monumental event to be a part of I mean maybe similar to the Liddell versus Ortiz 2 card where it's like a big event but not necessarily the individual outcome kind of thing like similar dynamic maybe yep yep I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I would have liked to have um, to have won, and you know, and and because I, I, I told myself before the match I was going to retire, win, lose, or draw. Um, um, but just uh, you know, just didn't didn't happen on the day. It seemed like you were very appreciative of all the people that helped you towards the end, though. Like I think I saw you shouted out Paul Dallow for helping you with sponsorship and everything throughout all of your UFC fights there. So it seems like you're an appreciative guy, like recognizing the people that brought you to the dance kind of thing. Absolutely. Like, um, you, you only as, you know, you only as strong as the people around you. And I always made it um, a point to, to, um, you know, have good coaches and managers and people to, to help me. And, 
Um, and I'm very thankful. I don't take anyone for granted. And, you know, I want to make sure that um, I thank um, uh, I thanked everyone. And, and even today, they're still, still all part of my life uh, today. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to ask this next question just as more of a curiosity-minded thing because I've seen Submission Underground has gotten a few events going on now, and I've seen certain retired MMA fighters popping up there, just some notable names on the Submission Grappling Circuit in general in recent years, even beyond that promotional bubble there. Is that something you'd be interested in, just considering your lengthy list of jiu-jitsu accolades, or is it mostly just focus on the academy and focus on training more so? No, no. I, I, uh, back in 2018, I I, I, uh, I went back after a, a long layoff. I, I went back to comp- uh, competing, oh, cool. and I competed. I competed in the uh, uh, Australian BJJ Championships, and I won. And then I went to Vegas that year in 2018 in the World Masters. And I competed in the Masters 4 division, which is uh, 46 to 50 year olds. And uh, I won a gold medal, like six matches, and won, you know, won the Open division in the World Championships in 2018. Uh, I went back in 2019, but I, was, I fell short one. I won silver medal. And I was going to go last year again, but obviously everything was shut down last year with, with COVID. And um, you know, if all goes well, I'll, I'll compete again this year. Well, that's awesome. I love hearing that. It's great that you're out there competing again. And just, yeah, like I said, great jujitsu accolades. So it's cool that you're out there. And clearly the results are in your favor. So that's awesome. But usually when I have fighters on as well, I ask if there's like particular genres of music they like to train to. Like if there's different artists they generally gravitate towards it seems like you're into the hard rock there you came up to kickstart my heart by motley crew for a few of those fights and i think you'd been to a guns and roses concert a while back too so like is that kind of the general vibe in the gym like when you get the aux cord are you kind of fine with whoever puts on what like what's the music that's generally bumped at the academy there uh look if it, if it was up to me it'd be all like you know, rock and roll, hard rock and heavy metal, but uh, you know, not everyone <laughs> likes that, that kind of music these days. So I have to mix it up a little bit. But yeah, definitely, definitely the the hair bands like you know Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses and Def Leppard are definitely a favourite. But um, you know, I like also you know the, the old school thrash metal like you know um, Metallica and Megadeth and um, uh, those bands as well. So so. Um, and just uh, just good old fashioned rock and roll bands too. No, that's all up my alley, man. You're speaking my language. Megadeth was the first concert I went to. Yeah, definitely some good shit. Gets me fired up, no doubt. But you've been really good with your time, man. And I want to be mindful of the fact that it's a bit later on your end than it is for me. I mean, I could talk to you all day just considering the experiences you've had and stuff like that. But I usually, you know, by the time I leave the gym and have some dinner, shower, I wind down a little bit. You know, I usually get to bed around one anyway. So, um, but uh, it has been good chatting. Yeah, I appreciate you making the time and just a lot of great insights on what was a great career overall, man. So really appreciate you making some time and just coming on the show and everything. And yeah, just, you know, you enjoy the rest of your night, man. Best of best of luck with everything going forward. And, and as far as like competing again with the submission grappling and yeah, just you have a good rest of your night. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for giving me the chance to chat.